welcome everyone to I'm here from Chicago and I welcome everyone to Socialism 2007, Socialism for the 21st Century. A weekend, this is the first night session of a, a weekend of political debate and discussion that people uh, are going to remember for years to come. Um, we're starting tonight with a speaker that is, that should, is no stranger to, to our socialism conferences, uh, Jeffrey St. Clair. Many of you will be familiar with uh, the website that he co-edits. Um, uh, Counterpunch. Um, he is a uh, 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 muckraking journalist and the uh, author of uh, several books. Uh, uh, one of them, uh, Grand Theft uh, Pentagon, um, and recently co edited um, End Times, The Death of the Fourth Estate, co edited with a Alexander Coburn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, rewind, rewind. Okay, um, he's also the author of Been Brown So Long It Looked Like Green uh, to Me, The Politics of Nature. Um, uh, tonight he will be speaking for us on hot climate, cold cash, making a killing from uh, global warming. Um, without further ado, welcome uh, Jeffrey St. Clair. Thank you, Elizabeth. But why are you here? I mean, I don't want to be here. I want to be over at Nicole's session. Okay? That's where the music is. War, what is it good for? War, what is it good for? All right. Let's rock. You know, I flew in to Chicago late last night from Oregon, and I woke up this morning to find myself transformed into a cicada. <laughs> I always look on the sunny side of life, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think... I've got some to tell. We need another intervention. Not in North Korea, not in Iran, not even in Darfur. We need an intervention in the White House. It's, it's obvious to all of us by now that his sobriety has been a terrible failure. <laughs> But you know, the dilemma that we face is that I'm not sure that beer alone will do the trick. <laughs> I don't even think a slug of scotch may be potent enough. I think we may need to recruit the Bush twins. <laughs> I think maybe they need to slip a couple of tabs of ecstasy into W's mojito. <laughs> but here's the rub, right? Even if Bush attains a kind of karmic enlightenment, it's not going to stop the war in Iraq. We have to own up to that fact. Trickle-down politics has failed us with bloody consequences. The so-called opposition party has failed us with bloody consequences. I speak as one of them, but the press has failed us too. Worse than failed us, the press has been complicit in these wars. The anti-war movement has failed us. We've failed ourselves 
and we better start facing up to that fact. We find ourselves in a perilous predicament. We're like characters in a play by Sartre, trapped in a war that I assume not one of us in this room wanted. A war ignited by outrageous fabrications, stoked by official paranoia, motivated by greed at the top of our government. And despite the tired claims of progr progress, the quagmire gets bloodier every week. More than 3,500 U.S. soldiers have died in Iraq, with four more now each day. 30,000 have been maimed. 30,000 Iraqis die every month. Iraqis want us to leave Iraq. Americans want us to leave Iraq. We are not leaving. Instead, we are surging. Why? Why are we sitting here in this room on this weekend night in one of America's most enlightened cities instead of blockading a recruiting center at the gates down in Crawford, on the steps of the Pentagon. I don't know, but we need to find out. We look for leaders, and we find none. King is dead. Malcolm X is dead. Berrigan is dead. Abby Hoffman is dead. Che is dead. Leonard Peltier is locked away in prison. Mumia is locked away in prison. Muhammad Ali is stricken by Parkinson's disease. John Lennon is dead. Joe Strummer is dead. Nobody can understand what the hell Bob Dylan is singing anymore. <laughs> Cindy Sheehan has gone home to tend her family, and she deserves that break. But activism by proxy won't get us through the night anymore. It is up to us. We must resurrect the art of resistance. As Michel Foucault said, it's resistance which unites us across the board. It's past time we flipped the switch and turned it on. Let's turn on our resistance. Now, I know that most of you probably came here instead of the better option, which was Nicole, <laughs> because you were hoping to feast on some juicy gossip about the great schism at Counterpunch <laughs> over global warming. You're going to be disappointed. There's not that much to tell. I mean, I'm in an awkward position. I find myself trapped between two owls. Al Coburn on one side, Al Gore on the other. <laughs> it's like being caught between a rock, Mount Coburn, and, well, I'm not sure what you would call it. I'm not sure what you would call Gore. Certainly not a hard place. No, more like a sponge, maybe. So you understand my predicament. I'm trapped between a rock and a sponge. So let me summarize my views. The planet is warming. This warming has been caused by the burning of fossil fuels and the wholesale destruction of those great carbon sinks, the, our primary forest. The nuclear industry and the biofuels cartel will profit immensely from justified fears about the consequences of a broiling planet. Al Gore's plan won't stop global warming. It won't even slow it down. Why has it come to this point? How did the environmental movement become the Terry Schiavo of social movements, more lifeless than the Democratic Party? That's the question I want to explore tonight. 
If you want to leave, I said you could leave. I even told you where you could go. I know there's at least one other Hoosier in the audience here tonight. And uh, I would like to say a final good goodbye to one of the greatest Hoosiers, Kurt Vonnegut. Vonnegut said, the dark ages, they haven't ended yet. A kind of political narcolepsy has settled over the environment, American environmental movement. Call it eco-on-we. You may know the feeling, restlessness, lack of direction, evaporating budgets, diminished expectations, a simmering discontent. This affliction appears acute, probably systemic. Cell phone trader. <laughs> Unfortunately, the antidote for this disorder isn't as simple as merely filing a lawsuit in the morning or maybe skipping that important PowerPoint presentation at work to join a road blockade for the day. No, something much deeper may be called for. A rebellion of spirit, a rebellion of the heart, just like in the good old days, not that long ago. Why is it, what is it precisely that's going on? Was the environmental movement bewitched by eight years of Bruce Babbitt, Bill Clinton, and Al Gore? Did it suffer a kind of allergic reaction to the new order of things? Are we simply adrift in a brief lacuna in the evolution of the conservation movement? One of those Stephen Jay Gouldian pauses before a great new creative evolutionary eruption? Perhaps our movement, if you're part of it, such as it was, experienced a kind of institutional uneasiness with the rules of engagement during the long Cold War in Clinton time. A war? Did someone say a war? Well, yes, there were hostilities, such as they were, and they remained buried beneath graceful gestures at meaningful discourse where the raw passions for rare places were, at the insistence of lawyers and lobbyists, politically sublimated or suppressed altogether. Now, environmentalism, as I came to know it, never thrived on its adherence to political etiquette or quiet entreaties, yet that became the mode of operation during Clinton time, and it has continued through the much rougher years of Bush and Cheney. Direct confrontation of governmental authority and corporate villainy was once our operational metier. No longer. Non-aggression pacts have been signed. An unofficial detente has been declared. Was it sealed in the spring of 1993 on the lawn of Blair House? where Al Gore was living at the time, perhaps while the cherry blossoms were in bloom? Did the late Jay Hare, CEO of the National Wildlife Federation, pulling down $750,000 a year in salary, forge a deal in the fall of that year to greenlight the logging of the last ancient forest in North America? What was the late Vince Foster's role in all of this? He had one, you know, but that's another story. Cold wars naturally engender such paranoid speculations. More than a decade later, this much is clear. The vigor of the environmental movement has been dissipated, drained by the enforced congeniality displayed in our disputes with Clinton and then Bush, with the Democrats in Congress and the green the grim green-suited legions of the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, the Bureau of Mining, Bonneville Power Administration, and the rest of the bureaucrats who are turning our public lands into a wasteland. Despite the rampages of the Bush administration, the big green groups, I call them gang green, <laughs> can't even rouse themselves into much more than the most reflexive kind of hysteria. What I mean by that is they send out fundraising letters printed in extra bold type. 
They're like so many vacant-eyed victims of Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> These professional environmentalists find themselves conscripts to the conference room and the consensus table. Situations about as satisfying as computerized chess or phone sex. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but I'll sign up for one jolt of electroshock over four years of group therapy any day. <laughs> Maybe I've had a few jolts, so I don't know. <laughs> Accusations of elitism that are hurled at us like political cream pies from the property rights jihadis hit their targets now more often than not. Once highly regarded and also deeply reviled as fierce advocates of the public interest, environmentalists are now largely dismissed in the living rooms of America as merely another special interest group, weaker than most, peddling its meager influence on Capitol Hill, angling for access to the anterooms, never the control rooms, always the anterooms of power, or at least a line item in the federal budget. What's worst? Our best efforts these days hardly seem to even raise a hackle on the hierophants of industry. After okaying the logging of ancient forests, signing off on anti-wilderness legislation in Oregon, Idaho, and Montana, pampering the whims of Bruce Babbitt and Dick Cheney, endorsing NAFTA and GATT, the failure to stand up for high-level whistleblowers inside the Department of Energy, the BLM, and the Forest Service, the mainstream environmental groups don't scare anyone anymore.